everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Economics, Principles, and Applications, 6th edition by Robert Hall and Mark Lieberman. Today we're going to be doing Chapter 7, Problem Number 7. Our problem says, Ludmilla's house of schnitzel is currently producing 10 schnitzel a day at point A in the following diagram. So what you notice is this is the diagram that you're given, or at least in spirit. It's not perfectly to scale, as nice as it was in the book, but hey, I tried. Uh, the only main difference is, like I said before, I always label this as a small Q if we're talking about individual firm production, just to distinguish it from the capital Q of market production. In the textbook, this is a capital Q. doesn't really matter. But we see this going on, and then we say, okay, we were talking about point A here. We can see that that is, in fact, at a level of 10 schnitzels of production. It says, Ludmila's business partner, Hans, an impatient sort, wants her to double production immediately. So that would mean that we're interested in going from producing a quantity of 10 to producing a quantity of 20, of course. So part A of the question says, what point will likely illustrate Ludmila's cost situation for the near future? So again, let's think about what this all represents, right? So you'll see that we have curves that are labeled ATC1, ATC2, and ATC3. And what these are is they represent short-run average cost curves for various different sizes of factories. Because we said in the short run, we've basically chosen a size of plant or factory, and we're trying to figure out how to get you know, more output out of that by changing the variable inputs that we have left, usually just labor. So we have less flexibility in the short run, and each one of these curves corresponds to a different size of plant. Probably this one being a smaller one, this one being a medium-sized one, and this one being a larger one. Who knows? The long-run average total cost curve, which we can see is this wider U-shaped curve here, represents the situation where we're taking a longer planning horizon and we actually have the flexibility to change not just the amount of labor within our predetermined size of plant, but we can also change the size of the plant. Or in another way, we can vary all of our inputs and we can actually, for every given quantity of output, figure out what the most efficient way and what the efficient mix of capital and labor is to produce that. So basically what we're saying here, a really simple way to think about it, is the long run average total cost curve at each quantity is saying, of all the different plant size curves we could be on, and you notice we would have more than just three options. We'd have a whole bunch of these different U's. For, you know, of all the possible plant sizes, which is the least cost way of producing this quantity Okay, let's take that cost and make it our long run cost. So for example here, assuming that we didn't have an average total cost curve that was lower than this one at point A, then this point's going to be on our long run average cost. Conversely, we can see that this point F is not going to be on our long run average total cost. And what that means, because you know our long run average total cost is down here, is that there must be some other factory size that can actually produce 60 units at lower cost than this factory size here. So if we're good with that, we can actually answer this question pretty easily. So back to the question, which point will likely illustrate Ludmila's cost situation for the near future? Well, near future means that we have a reasonably short run planning horizon. So in the near future, Ludmila is probably stuck on this average total cost curve here. She's stuck with a particular size of factory. So if she wants to increase her production output to 20 units, she's stuck on this same curve. And she says, okay, well now rather than being at my average total cost at 10, I'm at this average total cost at 20, and I'm actually gonna be on this point C here. The next part of the question asks, if Ludmila wants to keep producing 20 schnitzels, so she's gonna do this you know, repeatedly, not just that one time, at what point does she want to be eventually, and how can she get there? So we can look at this, and if we're continuing to produce 20 schnitzels indefinitely, then eventually we can start thinking about a long-run planning horizon. We don't have to say, oh, we're stuck with this size of, I guess in this case it would be a kitchen or bakery or something like that, right? We're not stuck with that size, 
we can actually think about how to move to something that's actually more efficient by changing the mix of capital and labor, increasing our production scale, or something like that. And so that's why, in the long run, we're able to move on to our long run average total cost curve. So in the long run, she's no longer stuck with this size of factory, that she has more flexibility to optimize. And she could say, actually, the least cost way I have to produce 20 schnitzels is this point B here. So in the long run, she's going to be able to decrease her costs from this amount to this amount. We say, how does she get there? She gets there by essentially by reorganizing, right? By changing the size of her plant, factory, kitchen, however you want to think about that, and thinking strategically about what the optimal mix of capital and labor is to minimize her cost of producing at this particular quantity. Part C of the question says, eventually, Ludmila and company do very well, expanding until they find themselves making 70 schnitzels a day. So eventually, they're all the way out here, right? But after a few years, Ludmila discovers that profit was greater when she produced 20 schnitzels per day. So she wants to scale back production to 20 schnitzels per day, laying off workers, selling off equipment, renting less space, and producing fewer schnitzels. Whereas her business partner, Hans, he wants to reduce output by just cutting back on flour and milk and laying off workers. So in other words, he wants to reduce output by only scaling back some of the inputs, not all the inputs. And the question says, who's right? And then discuss the situation with reference to these points here. So let's think about what's going on. We say, all right, we're at this production quantity of 70. So we're producing at this cost here. And then Hans is saying, and I'm going to quote this to make sure I get it right, he wants to reduce output by just cutting back on flour and milk and laying off workers. So basically, he wants to reduce output by only scaling back variable costs. He made no mention of actually moving to a smaller kitchen or a smaller factory, right? So if he wasn't changing any of his what are in the short run fixed inputs, what he's essentially saying is that he wants to scale back by staying on this average total cost curve here. That says, no, no, we'll stay in our giant kitchen and just not have anybody working in it. But if we were to extrapolate, you know, we have this general U shape here. If we were to extrapolate this, you know, think about what's happening as we're getting back to a quantity of 20. We're going to be even like, you know, I'm off the screen right here, right? So what's going to happen is his average cost of producing 20 units is actually going to be really high, which isn't surprising if we consider that this average total cost curve, it pertains most likely to a really big kitchen or factory. So then all of a sudden, if we're not scaling that back, when we scale back our production to only 20 schnitzels, we all of a sudden are paying for this huge factory that we're not using. And that's obviously going to have an adverse effect on our average cost as compared to a situation where we actually scaled everything back. So Ludmila says she wants to scale back production to 20 schnitzels per day, laying off workers, selling off equipment, renting less space, and producing fewer schnitzels. So she wants to scale back everything, right? She didn't explicitly talk about flour and milk, but it seems like she's taking a more all-inclusive view and saying, well, when I want to scale back, I'm actually going to reorganize my fixed costs as well and not just keep that huge factory that she's going to be able to, as she's making all these changes, actually get back to this point here because she seems more open to choosing the size of factory that's most appropriate for 20 schnitzels. The last part of the question asks, does the figure tell us what output Ludmilla should aim for? Why or why not? So what we see here, obviously, is information about our short run and our long run costs. But if you think about what the end goal of businesses are, the end goal of a business is to maximize its profit. And profit is not only cost, or not only the negative of cost, but it's the difference between revenue, you know, the money you're bringing in, and that cost, right? So even though it's tempting to say here, oh, well, we want to produce 40 because it's the lowest cost of production here. That's not necessarily true because that's only looking at one side of the equation, right? 
that we don't know without information about the demand for Ludmilla schnitzels, how her revenue is changing as we try to produce more, right? That if she's in a market where in order to produce more and actually be able to sell more, she has to lower her price, it may not be worth it to keep expanding her output. And we were sort of led to think about that a little bit, because if you go back to the previous part of the problem, it says, but after a few years, Ludmila discovers that profit was greater when she produced 20 schnitzels per day as compared to 70. That in and of itself leads you to think, huh, it's not necessarily optimal to just produce as much as possible. And it's actually not even optimal to produce whatever gets us to lowest costs here, because when we're in a market where a firm has any degree of market power, the demand curve that it faces slopes downward. And we say, well, if we want to sell 40 rather than 20, we have to lower our price to do so. And it actually may or may not be worth it. And we can't tell that from only looking at this cost information here.